you can't tell, I'm Casey. Um, also, this thing's just to make me look important. Um, I don't think it works. It's not even plugged in, in the back. Uh, my first time in Amsterdam, so uh, thanks for having us. Um, who, who's here, who here is from the Netherlands or Amsterdam? And then uh, Belgium, a lot, and then any other countries? Okay, cool, so we just have a one-on-one -on -one game going on. Perfect, so as Patrick mentioned, I uh, worked with him you know, on the marketing for The Lean Entrepreneur, which hit the New York Times list, which was cool. Uh, um, I'd helped with some similar projects before, but oftentimes with books, you think that they just, somebody just, li like a startup, you just kind of spin it up and throw it out there and it, it blows up. But uh, it's interesting, uh, everything that kind of goes on behind the scenes, of course, just like with random startups, there's sometimes books that just inevitably blow up, but uh, that's often not the case. Um, helped with uh, Paleo Hacks, which we grew to, um, I think, a pretty impressive uh, list size and um, traffic, and there were just a handful of us working on it, which is also the beauty of the internet. Uh, I think it what draws a lot of us to it is you can do so much um, with so few people. And, um, and then I've worked with quite a few startups. So you're gonna watch me chug a lot of water today, um, especially from talking all day. So uh, wh one of them being Mavenlink, and that's uh, the story I'm gonna tell real quick right now. And so with Mavenlink, if, you, uh, if you're not familiar, they're an online project management app. I'm sure you've tried one or two or 700 different project management apps. There's a lot of them out there. And uh, when I left, I, I was, you know, I, more or less like number two employee over there. And when I left, we'd had uh, 500,000 business customers. We were doing six figures uh, monthly recurring revenue. Uh, things were going quite well, but uh, it doesn't just happen like that overnight. Uh, even you know the overnight successes, such as like the Instagrams and whatnot, obviously uh, come from a lot of failure and, and applied learnings. And so with, with Mavenlink, it was, uh, it was like 2010, and uh, I'm up in San Francisco. Uh, I'm actually from Southern California. We piled into the car. Um, I was with my colleague, Taylor Miles. We go on up there, and there's uh, this big conference going on. It's uh, Google I.O. And for those of you not familiar with Google I.O., it's a, it's a huge developer conference. And uh, we're, sitting there, we're sitting there in our hotel, and I use the word hotel loosely. It was uh, what we kind of you know, scrapped together uh, there were seemingly cockroaches skittering through the room. Maybe that was just the story that I tell myself today to make it sound ro more romantic. Uh, but there we were, and you know, like, you know, how can we get how can we get more growth? And uh, you know, it's like early in the morning. I'm you know n nice and groggy, waking up, refreshing my Google Analytics, uh, which, as I'm sure many of you have tried before, that does not help your growth. Um, so I'm like, ah, damn it! Like, how how can how can we get how can we get this spike? How can we get this growth we need? And uh, we tried so many things, so many conventional approaches. Uh, we tried paid search, but it was costing us, you know, like fifty dollars a sign up, and only some of those would stick, and some would churn. Maybe a couple would pay, but the ROI was definitely not th not there, especially because we were a new product and there was so much competition. We tried SEO, but like I said before, you know, you Google project management software. And there's seemingly like 20,000 different options. I'm sure many of you feel that way with, with your own product. There's so much competition out there. Um, you know, we, of course, emailed like our friends and colleagues, but they don't really want to care about our app. They'll just sign up to make us feel good when, you know, we check our stats. Uh, we, tried to get, we tried to get publicity. So, you know, the tech crunches of the world. And uh, of course, they wouldn't cover us because they already covered, you know, the 19,000 apps before us. But we'd get some small blogs here and there. You know, we'd get like a little bump, but but nothing, nothing, you know, to get the traction that we needed. Uh, and then even, you know, like the product hunts, which product hunts wasn't available back then. But you know, submit it on Reddit and whatnot, and get these little lifts. But no nothing was sticking. And so again, we're we're at Google I/O, and the reason why we were there is because a couple of months prior, Google app. Google launched their Google Apps Marketplace, uh, which, which uh, if you're not familiar with, it's basically apps that, that connect to Google Apps. And the reason we did that was we're like, okay, you know, Google doesn't really half-ass things. Uh, this is before uh, Google Plus 
um, which <laughs> is, is like uh, the, the graveyard of social media. Um, so, you know, we're like, okay, th this could be a great opportunity, you know, to kind of like ride this wave. And we knew that they were going to pour a lot of resources into this, uh, which, you know, could, it's the rising tide lift, lifts all boats. And that's the way we looked at it. We hadn't thought, you know, f fully, um, you know, thought of like medium as a message and how this could potentially pull us up yet. And, and so there we were, and we got, since we integrated with them, uh, more or less when they launched the marketplace, we got one free ticket. So we, so we sent our CTO. So like, okay, this, this, could be, this could be our chance. This could be like a great place for us to really make a boom. There's media there. There's the Google fanboys and fangirls, I guess. Uh, there are integration partners. There's potential customers. And even more so than that, there was a Google Apps Marketplace team. And, you know, we really wanted to, to create a relationship with them. But there's everybody else under the sun there, you know, also vying for the top position that really want to make some buzz. And so how are we going to stand out? We're just another startup. And so we're sitting there, you know, in our, in our hotel room, and we're like, okay, what, what are we going to do? Like, we can't even go to the event. And so, you know, I, we, we, we call the CTO, and I'm like, hey, you know, kind of tell us what, what's, what's going on over there. You know, there's, there's the press, there's the marketplace team, there's potential customers. Um, but how are we going to stand out? I was like, okay, okay, they're obviously all there. Tell me more. It's like, okay, behind, behind the speakers, behind all the speakers where they have, uh, you know, like the sponsorships and whatnot, there's this, there's this uh, huge projector screen, bigger than this, and it's streaming the event with the Google, with the Google I.O. hashtag on Twitter. And this is, you know, before, this is, uh, again, 2010, so before, you know, your, your parents and the person who runs the laundromat and everybody else under the sun has a Twitter account. So, I, okay, perfect. Because also around the time that we integrated in the Google Apps Marketplace, we got into Twitter beta ads. And this wasn't, this wasn't like uh, how it is now, even though the product really hasn't evolved much. Uh, this is when you, you, had to, you had to get on the phone with them, talk to them. You had to like fax information and whatever the hell a fax machine is and, and like, you know, take a picture of like your, uh, your kids to prove that you are who you are and like send your social security number. It's really weird. Anyways, we also had a guarantee that we'd spend $15,000 a month. Well, I had no intentions of spending $15,000 a month, but they didn't know that at the time. So it's uh, ask for forgiveness later. So, so we get in there, and I was like, okay, perfect. I can almost guarantee nobody else at Google I.O. has Twitter ads. And so we sponsor at Google I.O., we sponsor the hashtag that they're streaming and everything else. And again, at this time, you know, the advertising platform isn't how it is today. It, wasn't, it didn't run through the stream like it does now. It didn't look like a normal Twitter or a uh, normal tweet. It was like highlighted in gold, and it just sat at the top, and it was like screaming for you to click on it. And it did not move. They did not cycle through new tweets. It just sat there at the top. I was like, perfect. So we fire it up. We have you know, our Google Apps landing page that we s threw a bunch of paid search traffic to and never panned out. And we just sat there at the top the whole time, above all the sponsors and everything, above every single speaker, the whole event. And because of that, we were kind of the buzz of the conference. And so it, it, worked, it worked wonderfully. Some, something we didn't really anticipate were, you know, we, we actually set, set um, our personal records for traffic and signups that day, all coming through the marketplace to help fuel the growth there. Uh, but, you know, we were able to start conversations with potential integration partners. Um, there was the press there. Um, again, there were custo potential customers there at the event. But even more so than that, we were, we were able to create a relationship with the Google Apps Marketplace team, and that's, that's what we really wanted to do. And, you know, because they're like, who, who are these guys? They actually sought out our team. You know, they were, like, hunting them down. They're like, who the hell's hijacked our Twitter feed? Because um, even, even if they'd changed the hashtag, we would just buy the next one. Um, and, and, you know, and, and, just, and this event, you know, really helped catapult us and take us to the next level. So after that, you know, we were able to talk to the marketplace team. They were, they were able to get us into, uh, when they would roll out new features, we were able to get, you know, beta access to that um, to take advantage of this marketplace. And, and, 
and then because of that, we were able to rise in the rankings. And is, do any of you have apps in a marketplace like iOS or Google Play? Yeah, so you know if you, if you can get some traction and get to the top, like, you know, they can really take you to the next level. And so because of this, you know, when we showed up, we were getting like hundred, you know, hundreds of signups a month. And, and by creating this rapport, they, they started manually featuring us. And we were able to rise in the rankings. And, and a couple months later, we, we got to number one in, in the project management category. And our, and our signups just skyrocketed. And then it only took one month after that, we, we got the number one spot in the entire apps marketplace. And we were able to hold that for, I think, nearly three years. And so every time somebody landed on the marketplace page, there we were, featured, number one. Uh, they would feature us in, in their scrolling bar because they would manually select it because we were able to create you know, a relationship with these people. On top of that, um, what we realized at the time when, when we were um, you know, spending money on paid search is we were competing against ourselves and Google because they were, I guess, paying themselves. They were advertising for project management, online project management. You search, you search for these categories. They were bidding against us to drive people to their marketplace. And we're like, OK, well, what if we're just number one there? And then they kind of pay themselves to feature us. That's pretty cool. And then we, we, used, and we used that success, being number one in the marketplace, number one in our category. That was pretty much on every single ad that we drew up because it's this, like many of you, I I'm sure, feel, you're this you know, early stage startup, you're this no-name startup, or may maybe you have some traction or whatnot, or you know, maybe you're big in the Netherlands and you want to go global, but you know, people are like, who, who the hell are you guys? And, but because of that, you know, we were able to say we're number one in the Google Apps Marketplace. We're number one on Google. And like, you know, that gives us a lot of validity. And so again, by finding this new medium and attaching ourselves there, you know, as, as they grew the marketplace, as they continue to drive more traffic to it, you know, it was able to like pull us up to the next level. So we went from getting hundreds of signups a month to hundreds of signups a day. And these, you know, in like the consumer world, that doesn't sound too insane, but these were business customers. Um, and again, by, by finding this channel and, you know, I guess hacking our way through the marketplace and, and I can get into the whole like asking for reviews and, and whatnot a bit later, but, you know, we were able to get to number one in our category, number one in the marketplace. And, you know, we thought we had this innovative product and then by finding this new channel, this new medium, it really helped take us to the next level. Here's, here's just a, a screenshot of that. Um, and again, too, you know, w w in some of these early marketplaces, oftentimes like the algorithms uh, on how they choose the best apps are, are relatively simple, you know. So we, we, you know, we were able to test some things to see, you know, how can, we, how can we really start driving growth within the marketplace. And that brings me to psychology. So any questions before we get into psychology? Cool. We'll go through this, then we get a coffee break, and then we get more Patrick. So, psychology. Oftentimes when I mention psychology, people, especially in marketing, people roll their eyes and they're like, psychology, whatever. Like, why the hell do I need to know this? That's like what my, you know, lazy buddy at university studied so he could, you know, chill out and party. But different psychology principles, I think, should be the foundation for all your marketing and growth hacking decisions. And I'm, I'm no PhD in psychology. Any, anybody here a PhD in psychology? No, I don't think any of us have the time or the drive or desire to become a PhD or some master's in psychology. Um, but I'm going to focus on Robert Cialdini's Six Principles of Influence. And so I'm sure many of you have heard it. Um, I highly recommend his book. Um, are, there, are there other principles? Has, has anybody read his book? There we go, a handful of you. Are there other principles? Yes. Can they be extremely helpful? No question. But again, there's only so much time in the day. There's only so much we can do. There's only so much we can focus on. Um, and so, you know, I think by focusing on these principles, you know, can, can really help drive a lot of growth. So I see many of you taking pictures. I write, write it down and write it aga down again, seriously. Um, or the 2015 version, use your iPhone or I guess your iPad. I have an old iPad, so it doesn't have a camera. I think it's funny when you're somewhere and you know, there's people taking pictures with like these massive iPads. What? 
Yeah, yeah, we'll, 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 we'll um, mail them out later as well. So I'll run through these with, my um, with, with how I've been able to use them. Um, but, you know, for instance, like with reciprocity, you know, it's, um, you know, let's, let's see, uh, you know, what's, your, what's your name? Chris. So I give Chris a sticker. He says, thank you. And, you know, he, he feels, you know, or maybe he doesn't, maybe he's really selfish, uh, but most people feel obligated to return the favor. Okay? People are, um, it's a book by like Dan Ariely, people are like predictably irrational, but, but you know, everybody, whether they're in, you know, Amsterdam, Southern California where I am, um, somewhere in Asia, everybody kind of, you know, f acts and thinks very similarly. Um, there's commitment and consistency. So um, I actually use this sometimes just to have a little fun with my friends. Uh, you know, um, I'm, I'm really into like basketball and American football, and so I'll, I'll try to get my friends to make, you know, some you know, outlandish claim on sports and then uh, draw them in and then just kind of flip it on them, use it against them. I'm sure, you know, you hear your friends there like, oh, I love, uh, I love this, this, you know, this this football club or th he's like the greatest uh, or she's the greatest you know soccer or football player of all time uh, and they won't budge you know how people are they just they 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 claim something they make a statement and and you know they they, w they won't change um and they, they won't change it and so uh i'll talk about how I, I was able to use um to use that so social proof it's like uh you know you're walking down the street and there's two bars and one of them there's no line and the other one there's this crazy huge line and you're like okay well that's that's got to be the cool one so you wait in line you pay you know some some fee to get in or whatnot and then you get in and there's like seven people and you're like oh what the hell there like why is there even a line but you know it's by design um authority you know people just tend to follow the proven leader uh, if somebody's done it before, you know, you're, you're much more likely to listen to them. If they've been able to provide you value to help you do things better, you'll listen to them versus just, you know, some random person on the street. Uh, liking. People tend to, to listen to and agree with people that they like. And then scarcity. If there's, there's a reason why there's, you know, the limited time options um, or, you know, this deal will never be available again. And so... So that's false scarcity. I mean, I think people just kind of assume that, but you know, if you can you can actually provide like real scarcity, like it will never be available again. I mean, if 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 Sometimes, like with Groupon, for instance, you know, it'll be like, oh, this massage is parlor is only going to give you, you know, 50% off for the next couple of days. And you're like, ah, I've seen this like 300 times. It's, uh, it, it's, not, it's not true scarcity. Yeah, ticket sales, or maybe um, like you're you're you have a, like a new feature coming online, and for all existing customers, they can get it you know for free or for you know fifty percent off or something like that, and it's never available again. Like you can just draw a line in the sand. Agreed. Perfect. So great question. I'm going to get to that in a sec, and with some with some with some data, and I'll show. Uh, actually, I'm glad you pointed out because I'll show you. Uh, I'll show you how it worked for me. So, months ago, my friend's like, "Hey, I, I have this site. It gets insane traffic. Uh, it's in the it's in the word game site. So, like Scrabble and Word with Friends. Every, you guys know Scrabble and Word with Friends, I assume. And so he's like, "Hey, it gets a ton of traffic. I'm making money off AdSense. Um, anybody here trying to make money off AdSense? Yeah, it's." How would you describe it? A complete failure? 
Yeah, so you hear that oftentimes. Um, actually, there's some idea, I think, good ideas, uh, which we'll get to later on how you can target sites that are running AdSense, because um, most of the time, they're even if they're getting a lot of traffic, they're probably making you know not even not even enough money to pay for their hosting. So my buddy has a site getting creative traffic. He's actually making solid money on AdSense, but he's like, you know, there's I, th I feel like there's so much low-hanging fruit. You know, uh, well, I'm not. There's no community. We're not making money in any other way. And so this example, it's it's a it's for a product. It's in the e-commerce space, but the same the same thing can be applied for for your for like a SaaS product. Come on in. Mm. We got goodies too. So again, he's getting a bunch of traffic, and I'm like, okay, I think I know I think I know your market. I think I know what products these people want. Um, I looked in like the analytics a little bit to see what they wanted. I was like, just um, just put a little link in the top and send them to this landing page, and uh, we'll make a bunch of money. We'll high five. It'll be awesome. We'll put no time and effort into this. It'll be great. So he's like, okay, perfect. Sends a link to this landing page. Sends 17,000 visitors. We get two sales. 0.012% conversion rate. Wow. Not only was I very disappointed because I made no money. We made like I, I, not even enough to you know buy us like uh, to even pay for like the Uber to get to the bar to drink a beer together. I was I was embarrassed. I was like Jesus. Like I consider myself a, a pretty good marketer. I feel like I understand this thing. Um, and you know he, he's looking at me. He's like, what the hell? I thought you knew what you were talking about. Like what is this? Deep breath. Take a step back. I was like, okay. Let's use, let's use like, these psychology triggers. Let's get to know our audience better. And how can we use that to really grow this? So again, like, like I'm sure many of you feel, I had no budget. Um, I had no develop so he's like, yeah, you can try this, but I'm not, I'm not giving you any money to spend. You can spend some of your own money, but I, of course, didn't want to do that. Uh, I'll skip down. There are no developer resources. I'm sure many of you feel this way, where it's like, oh, if the, if the developers would only finish you know, this feature, or if the developers would only you know, do this to the site for me, or oh, I, you know, I can't move forward because the developers can't do this. Well, you know, anybody working on a, uh, on a SaaS product or anything else, it's the dev queue gets longer every single day. No product. I mean, I guess I had a shitty product that nobody wanted, but I really had no product and, and no market knowledge. So I thought I knew what was going on. Um, and it's, m many people won't admit that they don't have any market knowledge, or maybe they do, but you know, I really had to s figure out, like, how did, how did my customers think? You know, how did they talk? What did they really want? I couldn't just look at you know, Google Analytics to see what pages they were looking at and just give them that. I had to you know, really, really talk to these people. So I started e putting up, so I put an email pop. Again, I looked at analytics and I was like, okay, I know that the people kind of want X, Y, and Z. I can, give it to I can give that to them for free. So I put this carrot out there, you know, uh, start winning games and, you know, get, the, get these strategies for free. Where should, where should I send, where should I send your, you know, your free tips? So they started giving me e their email addresses. I started, you know, getting more information. I started uh, trying to you know, get this reciprocity flow going, where they just had to give me their email address. You know, they committed to that. They committed that they wanted to learn. And so I started delivering them this free stuff. Uh, in this example, uh, you know, I do the, um, what's, what's the Julie Andrews movie? Yeah, Sound of Music, you know, uh, like a little fun word play, do, re, mi. Um, I won't sing, because then you'll definitely I'll get the hell out of here. Um, you know, so I try to be funny, you know, get them to like me. Aside from giving them tips to help win, you know, I I'd actually get emails like this. Uh, whether I was actually funny or not, I guess, uh, you know, that c each person can be the judge of that. But, you know, I get emails like this, like, your tips are awesome. Like, you, you keep helping me win. And again, this is, this can be applied to, like, a SaaS product. If you have, like, a project management solution or, like, an accounting solution, it's like, you know, here's how you save money on your taxes. Everybody wants to do that. Here's how you can spend less time with your accountant. Everybody wants that. Um, you know, your, your humor is Im impeccable, so uh, I, I did not pay them to write that. But, um, you know, and you don't necessarily need to be funny. Maybe you have a B2B product, but, y but write to a person. 
you know, oftentimes you'll get these newsletters and, and it's like, you know, it's like some machine spit this out and, you know, you're, you're talking to a wall, like right, right to a person. There's, there's a reason why companies like, uh, you know, like Buffer, which is a social media sharing tool, you know, they, they really try to like uh, open the kimono and show their, um, you know, show their finances and, and, and show that they're people as well. And people respond well to that. And so again, so I started just giving them free stuff. Then I sent a survey, and I kind of drew a line in the sand. I told these people I had this awesome product that I'd been working on forever coming, and I hadn't even started on it. But the survey was the first step. And again, if I sat up here and I was like, survey your customers, you'd be like, okay, what the hell, we all know to do that. But many people don't. And, and also, actually, at another event, somebody, they raised their hands, they go, Surveying, does survey even work anymore? Well, of course, talking to your customers still work. But they're like, well, people get, people get surveys all the time. And I completely agree. Like, uh, I bought something the other day on Amazon, and I get some, some, uh, some survey from the person who I bought it from, and there were like literally 37 questions. Like, I don't have time to do that. So in this situation, I asked one question. You know, what is, what is your biggest pain, and how can I help them solve that? And that's an important thing, too, is with these surveys, if, if it's like, here, like, help me get better feedback on my customer support staff, it's like, well, wh what's in it for me? And Patrick's going to talk about you know, the whole what's in it for me with the partnership stuff. But especially when you survey and you ask something from these people, like, it, it should be for them. It's, it's for your customers. That's why you're doing it. When you're asking them for feedback, you know, it's, it's not because... It, it's, it's so you can provide them better value. And so I started listening to these people. I started learning that my, uh, my audience were mostly uh, women over the age of 50, so if any of you in that market, I, I have a, a lot of emails. Um, so they started telling me what they wanted. Like, I would appreciate getting you know, X, Y, and Z. It's like, perfect. Again, I didn't have a product yet, and so I created exactly what they wanted. Another thing too, you know, I started th like listening to how they spoke, so I could go through, change my emails, change my marketing, and I would just oftentimes like copy and paste exactly what they wrote, and I would feed that right back to them. The pre-launch. So again, I was uh, doing this also to kind of buy myself some time because I claimed I had something coming and I didn't yet. Um, but it's like uh, I had that carrot. I was like, hey. I have an insider discount just for you, which was true. And when I release this, and this will only be available for a few days, which was also true. And then I just kept providing them value. And people are often like, well, what if I give them so much free stuff that they'll, they'll never buy? Well, my response often is then your product isn't good enough. You know, so I just kept giving them free stuff, you know, and, and they, kept, they kept winning. I was creating this authority. I'd get responses like, uh, I just, you know, I just beat my, uh, my daughter-in-law for the seventh time in a row, and, you know, <laughs> which uh, I guess is what they were looking for. Um, and then, oh, another thing you can't see in this email, oftentimes I would ask people to reply to me. And so I'm sure, you know, m many of you, you've done uh, email marketing. So, you know, like, so I'm sure you follow, like, Gmail seemingly ha like, has this like, obligation with themselves to like, roll out like, a new change, so it's, it's harder and harder to get emails into in the, um, people's inboxes. Well, I would often ask them uh, questions to try to get people to reply to me, because what I found is when they reply, uh, then I can start getting, you know, my deliverability increases. So again, but I kept dangling this carrot. I was like, hey, this awesome thing is coming. I kept giving them value, and I'd get emails like this all the time, which feel pretty cool. It's like, thank you, like, how can I give you my money? And that's a pretty cool feeling, you know? Like, I, th I thought I knew what I was doing, but it, when, when it's validated, and people are like, hey, how can I get this thing? Like, I'll pay more now. Um, and then the launch came. And I was still, I was still providing the value. And again, I would just take snippets from like the other emails. Like uh, this, this woman, Ellen, wrote, "I've laminated your list." Well, I don't know if I've ever personally laminated anything in my life, but but that's who the audience was. So you know, I was, I was like, you know, showing the social proof. And again, it might be different for yours. It might be like an accounting app or you know, uh, project management or whatnot. But but by regurgitating like the value. And providing these people, and also I, I wanted to show the social proof and, and still, cr you know, ma make things fun uh, and, and kind of raise the bar. Like uh, this Tanya woman replied and she said she cross-stitched what I wrote, and whether she did or didn't, I, I don't know. But, uh, you know, it was just kind of funny, and, and people, you know, they just kept replying. Um, and also another thing I did for social proof 
is uh, when I asked people what they wanted, I sent, I, sent them to, um, I sent them to like a blog post that I put out. And I said, put in your comments what else I can provide. And I, and I was nervous. Like, people had been replying to the emails. Um, but I wanted, I wanted to show the social proof and kind of like get people talking. And, but I was scared. Like, I was like, what if people land on this and nobody leaves a comment? Like, you go to so many you know, blog posts or whatnot, and there's like zero comments. So I guess I kind of cheated. I left the first comment, so I knew there'd be at least one. But what if people showed up and there were like two or three? Well, there were hundreds and hundreds of comments. And because of that, people felt more obligated to kind of interact with each other and keep telling me more and more what they wanted, which is great, because that's exactly the product that I created. And before I get to the results, well, I guess this kind of shows it, as I tracked every single metric. So like Patrick mentioned before, you know, the, what's the one metric that matters? I feel like oftentimes um, the, big, the biggest thing that startups or you know, online businesses or small teams do poorly is they you know, try to serve everybody under the sun, which is the surest path to uh, failure. Um, and also like focusing on a bunch of metrics that don't really matter. For some companies, page views matter. For most, they don't. But figuring out, you know, for your business, what is, especially like, what is the one metric, maybe a couple, but what is like the one metric that matters? And for me, it was items purchased. But I wanted to track the whole flow. Like, where were their breaking points? Um, you know, was I, was I having issues with open rate anywhere? Uh, were, people, were people not clicking on the emails? Um, were people hitting my landing pages and then not purchasing? So again, as you can probably r recall from before, 0.012% conversion rate. So I launched it. Um, and, and also another thing is, is often people ask, like, did I segment my list? So in this case, I served everybody the same email, except for when it came to pricing. And I actually tested that. I sent, I sent three different emails. I wanted to provide a discount. If any of you guys do anything in, uh, in um, uh, e-commerce or in the affiliate space, I, I often recommend uh, tracking your earnings per sent email and your earnings per click. And so that's, that's actually the metric I was measuring, earnings per click here. And so for everybody that landed on my landing page with like the 50 or 60% discount, I made $1.20. But everybody who I gave 70% discount to, I was actually making $1.50 per click. Um, so like, hmm, what were my conversion rates here? So again, I was building up this demand. I was creating a relationship with these people. I was giving them back exactly what they told me. Um, and I was able to get, you know, 7, 8% conversion rate. Uh, your question before about, you know, do, does scarcity really matter? If you look down here, 19% conversion rate for the people, for when I said, this is the final day. I was like, 19%? Well, that's insane. It's like, hmm, what if I sent another email today? Yes? No, this was like a, th these were, this was like the specific product landing page. Um, and I think uh, like with the Google Apps example, you know, we weren't just sending them to the home page. Uh, Google Apps was kind of providing some message by, you know, sending people. It was coming from the Google Apps Marketplace, but the landing page was very specific on that, you know, so it's the, the message remains consistent, which I think is extremely important. Um, and so it was like, okay, I got 19% conversion rate. What if I sent another email and said, you know, instead of there's one day left, there's only four hours left. 30% conversion rate. So again, from 0 0.012, by kind of using these principles and, and, and creating these relationships with these people, able to obviously <laughs> convert much better. I think we sold uh, like 900 products. Um, and I'll give the results in a sec. And so with, with, with like the full stack marketing and why I think this is important, and people are like, full stack marketing, isn't that just like another term for marketing? that you marketers made up so you could like sound more important and charge more money. It's partially true, but but also the reason why I find it important is because, you know, I, I could be wrong, but I'm assuming almost all of you, if not all of you, you're not, you know, you're not Facebook, you're not Google, 
you're not Zynga, you can't afford you know, this, this massive SEO team, you can't afford like an email marketing team, you can't afford a conversion rate optimization team, um, you, you probably can't even spend money on paid marketing. Uh, and so you have to kind of understand the different disciplines and how they work together and kind of how you can stack them on top of each other. So for instance, in, in this case, we primarily used SEO and also email and some social, but mostly SEO to bring everybody to the site. You know, from then from there, we kind of use some of like our psychology principles and email marketing and conversion rate optimization to, to activate them, then to retain them. You know, the, the emails, the storytelling, uh, the, with referral again, email marketing, and then from the revenue, conversion rate optimization, analytics, looking for these breaking points, and again. Why this is important is because maybe you run marketing. Like uh, with MavenLink, there were two of us, we, and we had to do everything. At the end of the day, all you or your boss or the VC um, want is, is growth. It's most likely revenue growth or customer growth. They don't care how you get there, but you need to understand how all of these things kind of function together to get you there. So then here's just a quick shot. And so, you know, we sold 900, 900 items. We were able to get $15,000 in sales in just, I think that's like five or six days. And again, it's not like $3 trillion like, you know, like Facebook might be, might be expected to make, but there was just one person working on this product and, and uh, my, my partner who, you know, basically said, go for it, but you get no help. And this was just the beginning. So again, it went from like two sales, which I think maybe made us like $50, to 15,000. And people often ask, like, how can I get there? How can I do it quickly? Because that was the biggest thing, too, is this was just like a random side project I was, I was doing with a friend. I thought it'd be fun. Um, and, and I didn't want to spend any money. And I wanted to be able to spin these things up quickly. And you know, I, can, I can hack on like WordPress, or WordPress and like a handful of other sites, but I can't, I can't build something from scratch. I, I'm not uh, some front end and back end full stack developer. So with survey tools. Um, I actually also used, uh, so you can use Google Forms. Most of us are probably using Gmail or Google Apps. And you can spin this up for free. It will take you seconds. Uh, we'll, we'll also give an example later of how you can uh, use Wufoo and MailChimp together to pass a bunch of like um, hidden information about your customers so you don't have to ask them more questions, again, to reduce the friction. Pop-ups. Um, so many sites pop people because they want to start harvesting the emails, which is, which is good. Um, but I wanted to you know, turn, that, turn that email into, into money. Like with, uh, with, with Paleo Hacks, we did that. And so for here, I use Qualaroo. Uh, the reason why I liked Qualaroo is because uh, it, looks, it looks really good on mobile. Like with, with Paleo Hacks, we knew that we'd, we'd make around like a dollar or a dollar 20 from every email in the first month. Um, and so basically, we, that was like our metric, email addresses. Traffic and everything was like all funneled towards getting email addresses. And um, when looking at their analytics, we started trying to optimize there. I noticed that 33% of our traffic was from mobile, which is like over three or 400,000 uniques a month. So obviously there was like a lot of low hanging fruit. There's a lot we were leaving on the table. Uh, there are other options, of course. There's Sumo Me, there's you know, custom, custom products. Uh, I'm sure there's a bunch that I'm forgetting. And then uh, payment. So that was another thing that was important. If you guys, if any of you are doing uh, e-commerce products or want to sell something, I used Gumroad. There's, again, many other options. Uh, but what I like with it is they, they handle that you can do landing page creation on the site, uh, which is mobile optimized. Uh, they'll, they'll process the payments. Uh, have any of you worked with a payment processor before? Yeah, is, is it fun? <laughs> Yeah, so like with, with Paleo Hacks, we, we used one and uh, they were holding on to like, you know, a substantial amount of money for like six months and they like would not release it forever. It was the most painful thing ever. That's why I like something like Gumroad. They take the risk for you. Um, and, and also like you can actually, I would use them for my landing pages and whatnot. You can of course like embed their information like on WordPress or your, your site or whatnot. Um, API, is it, have any of you used Zapier? Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a great tool. I highly recommend it. Um, and for you, those of you not familiar with it, 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 connects, uh, it connects like the APIs of different products. So in this case, um, I saw we were actually making some sales, so I was pretty stoked on that. And I was like, okay, what if I could upsell these people and give them more stuff that they want? And so, uh, you know, in like 
the click of a couple buttons through Zapier, I, I was able to connect um, uh, Gumroad to Mailchimp and put them into a whole nother funnel. And I don't know how to, you know, you get into like the uh, Gumroad and Mailchimp APIs and connect them. So it, it's it's uh, quite nice. Uh, with email automation, I use Mailchimp a lot. That's because just what I care about most is email deliverability. They also provide really good analytics, um, but I've I've often had good success there. There's plenty others. There's Constant Contact. Um, we provide uh, you know some some free access to Drip and ConvertKit, which are also great tools. There's I feel like there's a new email software tool rolling out every single day. Um, and then for analytics, yeah. Yeah, so, so when I got them, I was just, uh, I, I'd m email them weekly. So I'd give them like weekly tips, and then when I did the launch, I emailed them every single day. And so again, it depends on your product. Um, I think m for the most part, I think people should probably email their customers more than they, uh, more than they do. Oftentimes people be like, oh, well, I don't want to like spam them. Well, don't spam them, provide them value. Um, also, uh, you know, when you don't hear from companies, especially if like you're doing some pre-launch stuff, I hear a lot of people will do like pre-launch stuff. Like I, I see it myself. You'll, you'll, they'll do like a good job of capturing a bunch of emails, uh, but it'll be like six months until they launch. And so, you know, six months later, I, I don't remember what the hell you were trying to sell me. I, I don't remember like the value that I thought. So like, if you can keep the conversation going and providing them value, um, I'd, I'd do it more often than not. But again, it's, it's different for every company. Yeah, so gr great question. Um, often, like w w with Mavenlink, for instance, it was mostly just because I guess I was na naive at the time. Like, uh, we, we would do like these newsletters, and again, we'd try to provide value, but you know, there'd be uh, images and links to like every single blog post we'd written in the past month, and there'd be like follow us on Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn and Google, and there'd be images to, to other things. Uh, but I, I almost always go with plain text. I feel like uh, it just it seems more personal. Um, I wasn't getting people's names, but if you can you know insert people's names, of course, things like that um, can help. Also, Patrick will talk about this in the next example, but I'd always have uh, one link um, for, for the most part. Uh, I might actually, there might be multiple links, but it'd always go to the same page. And it basically, I'd have like one objective from every email. Because oftentimes you get this newsletter, or this email, and there's like 3,000 things to do, and you're like, what, what the hell's going on? Like making things simple for people. Um, also, I'd always a end with like a question to try to like ins uh, get like some conversation going. Um, sometimes I would keep them very short, especially if like, uh, like with the survey example, but sometimes, you know, I would, I would, I'd, it was like the, almost like a long form sales letter would serve as the email. Um, and then lastly, analytics. So there's, you know, Mixpanel, there's Kissmetrics, there's a lot of, you know, great analytics tools. I often stuck with Google, Google Analytics, I think with, you know, analytics plus, plus their events, plus their goals and whatnot. Um, you know, you can kind of track everything under one platform. There's other options, of course, which, which work great. Um, and then I just tracked everything in Google Docs. And so I'm sure I could have, you know, done some MySQL query and pulled a bunch of data and tapped into Google Analytics API, et cetera, to automate it. But you know, I just I wanted to see like where were their breaking points, uh, where were things going well, what could I possibly optimize, and then just track everything in Google Analytics, and or Google Docs. Plus, it's free, which uh, I think most of us quite like. So that's psychology, and uh, some tools there. Any questions before we uh, break for a couple snacks and coffee? Right. Yeah. So, so, so I've had good. Yes. Yeah, so, so, his question was, uh, what about? Um, or you want to stand up and and repeat it so I don't botch it. Yeah, so, so I've had great success with those as well. Like uh, I've used uh, Pardot a decent amount, uh, which is great. In this situation, I didn't because I wanted to keep things lightweight. I wanted to get things going pretty quickly. 
And a lot of times I'll see people like, uh, the reason why nothing ever happens is because they see this, you know, they, they're like, oh, well, things, everything needs to be perfect. I have all this stuff to do, and it never gets done. So I wanted to make sure that it got done. It's also why I said, you know, this product will be avail available, like, on this date. So there was, like, a line in draw drawing a line in the sand. But uh, if, you, if you have the experience um, and the resources to roll out something, you know, like a Marketo or a Pardot, uh, where everything is very, uh, you know, action-based. I, I mean, I highly recommend that. Anytime, we'll get into segmenting later, but anytime you can provide, like, a more specific message for somebody, you know, it just obviously resonates a lot better. Like I said earlier, like, if you target uh, the whole world or, um, you know, it's nothing's going to, nothing obviously is going to pan out there. Um, but th those, those work well, too. Cool. So there's coffee. There's uh, some cookies and stuff.